right. Okay, I think everyone should be able to see it now. Yep. Okay, so um, yeah, as Josh mentioned, this is the, the boot camp for homework for part one. Um, and yeah, let's get started. So this homework is going to be focusing on using a recurrent neural network to model language and generate text. So essentially, we're going to be focusing on language modeling, which is the task of um, estimating the probability distribution of token sequences in a language. And in this homework, in this homework in particular, it's going to be word sequences that we're going to be working with. So this modeling allows us to compute the probabilities of uh, specific sequences, as well as generate token sequences from a language. And your two main tasks in this homework are going to be um, predicting the next token in a token sequence, as well as generating tokens. Um, and that's what we're going to be covering in today's bootcamp. So first, we're going to be talking about um, computing the probability of a token sequence. So first, we're going to talk about what a token sequence is. So a token sequence is a complete uh, sequence of tokens that has a definitive beginning and end. And so this brings us to the question of what exactly do we define as a complete token sequence? So if you guys have read the write-up, you know we use the example of um, the sequence four score and. And so from its appearance, it initially looks as uh, looks to be an incomplete token sequence. But for example, if a novice actor went on stage and for the first time and said four score and, then got nervous, quit the play, and went home, in this particular scenario, four score and would be a complete token sequence. So we distinguish complete token sequences using two things, which are start of sequence and end of sequence markers. So um, a start of sequence marker, which is going to be represented as SOS indicates that a token sequence has just begun and is prepended to our token sequences. And so the symbol that immediately follows this SOS tag is actually the first token in the sequence. And this is simply like a marker to indicate the start of a sequence. And the end of sequence marker, which is often represented as um, EOS, is indicating the end of a complete sequence. And once again, just like the start of sequence marker, it's not actually the final token in the sequence. It just simply indicates that our sequence has ended and is now complete. So um, again, if you read the write-up, it also mentions that for convenience, we sometimes just have the same tag to indicate both start of sequence and end of sequence. Um, and in this, using the standard, we would just be using EOS for both, for both the start of sequence and end of sequence markers. So now we're going to come to how exactly we represent tokens. So the obvious way um, to represent a token in a vocabulary would just be as a one-hot vector using the one-hot encoding. But this approach is actually extremely wasteful. And this is due to the problem of high dimensionality. So for example, if our vocabulary had like 1 million words, for each token, we would require a, a million dimensional vector, which is obviously extremely uh, wasteful. So to deal with this problem, what we do is we typically project these one hot vectors down to a lower dimensional space using um, a linear transformation. So um, each d-dimensional one hot vector is converted to a reduced n-dimensional vector by multiplying it by an um, n by d projection matrix. And so this projection itself is implemented as an n by d linear layer, which we apply to every input and pass into our network. And so what exactly is this projection matrix? Um, since we're using RNNs for our language modeling, uh, our projection matrix, our matrices are going to be considered part of our model and they're going to be learned along with all the other parameters of our network. So now that we've covered uh, what complete sequences are and how we represent these sequences, we're going to come to the actual problem of um, how do we compute the probability of a token sequence. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually decompose this probability using the Bayes rule. And that's um, shown in the formula on your screen. So if you can see um, the figure um, displayed on the slide, the probability of this token sequence is actually decomposed as um, the probability of the first token given all the previous tokens before it into the probability of the second token given all the previous tokens before the second token all the way up until our um, last token. So here, um, P of Tn given SOS, Tm, T1 all the way to Tn minus one is the probability that Tn is the nth token in our sequence given that SOS 
SOS um, T1 um, all the way to Tn minus one are the first N minus one tokens from the beginning of our token sequence. So all these probability terms are going to be computed by um, our neural network. And theta over here actually represents the parameters of our network, which needs to be learned somehow, which we're gonna cover um, in the further slides. Uh, yeah, so now we come to the actual steps to compute these probabilities. So like we talked about in the previous slide, we can compute, we need to compute the conditional probability of an nth token given uh, the previous n minus one tokens as input in order to get the probability of our entire um, token sequence. So um, these steps, which are also outlined in the write-up are as follows. So the first step would be to feed the entire sequence of characters into the network. And at each step, the network will output the probability distribution for the next character in the sequence. And so at each time step, we would select the probability that is actually assigned to the next character um, in our sequence. And the product of all these selected probabilities across all the time steps is the total probability of the, our, our token sequence. And you can see this in the pseudocode as well, which is in our write-up. So we have the initial hidden state and we have the initial token index, as well as an accumulator variable log prop. And so we now iterate over our token sequence. We get um, the embedding for a specific token using the projection matrix. And then we pass um, our current hidden state as well as the embedding for this token into our RNN step method, which is essentially passing it into our RNN. Um, and we're going to get the probability distribution for the next character in the sequence Y. And then we're going to index into this and get the probability for the actual next token in our sequence. We're going to take the log of that and just add it to our accumulator variable. And that is what we are going to return at the end, which is going to be the probability of our entire word sequence. And um, how this exactly relates to our tasks, prediction and generation is that you guys are going to be asked to generate tokens or like extend a token se sequence by a given amount. So we are actually going to be evaluating your model's ability to generate text by computing the probability of your token sequences using um, obviously what we've talked about so far. And we're going to see if the text that you're generating is actually highly probable according to your language model. And that's how we're going to evaluate how well, how well your language model is generating text. Um, yeah, so like we talked about before, how exactly are we going to train a network that computes these probability distributions? So we're going to be using um, the standard approach for training parametric probability distribution models, which is uh, maximum likelihood estimation. And once again, we highly recommend that you read the write-up regarding this because there's a lot of very useful information just regarding the theory behind maximum likelihood estimation. So um, if we look at our first figure, the log probability of any sequence SI is given by um, this sum. And so what we're gonna do is we're actually going to try to minimize the, our, our loss function, which is our objective function, which is equivalent to the negative uh, total log probability of all the training data. So what maximum likelihood estimation is essentially going to be doing is it's going to be computing the theta that minimizes this loss or minimizes this uh, objective function. Uh, so now we move on to our, the data set that you guys are going to be working with. So this is the Wikitext 2 language modeling data set. Um, we're going to be giving you training as well as validation files, which um, contain an array of articles. Uh, to be specific, 579 articles are going to be contained in your training set. And each one of these articles is actually an array of integers, which are uh, going to be words from our vocabulary. And you can concatenate these articles to perform batching, and we recommend that you should shuffle um, articles between epochs during training, and we will come to this uh, later in boot camp. But these are very useful tips for you guys to follow. And uh, yeah, our vocabulary file is essentially going to be an array of strings, and we have 33,278. Um, strings or vocabulary items in our language. And yeah, now we come to the data loader part of this assignment. So um, since your main task is to build a language model that you will use to perform text generation, um, obviously your samples should be formatted in such a way that um, makes it more likely for you to successfully train for that specific task. So um, the following hyperparameters are hyperparameters that you can um, that you can tune at your convenience. We have sequence length as well as batch size. So for example, if you see um, 
the, the figure on your screen, the sequence length here is three and the batch size is two, which means that one batch consists of two pairs of sequences, um, which are pairs of input sequence comma target sequences, where each sequence uh, is of sequence length three. And so what you guys are going to want to do is you're going to want to overwrite the iter method in your data loader class, which will allow you to format your samples in whatever way you desire. And you should also be tuning these hyperparameters, sequence length and batch size. And uh, the iter method should do the following, which is listed on your screen. It should randomly shuffle all the articles from your data set, um, concatenate all the articles in the data set, and then divide this complete corpus into inputs and targets, where the targets are shifted by a window of one word. And as you can see in your samples, the targets are shifted by a window of one word from the uh, input sequences. And then you're going to want to resize your inputs and targets um, into batches of articles based on whatever batch size you want. And then you're going to run a loop that yields a tuple of input comma target sequence in every iteration which is going to be based on the other hyperparameter that you want to tune sequence length. Um, and both of these components uh, should have shape, batch size, comma, sequence length. And this is also, once again, explained very well in the write-up. So we highly recommend that you go through that in detail. And yeah, I think, yeah, Josh, you want to take it from here? All right, yeah. Um, so I should probably share screen. Yeah. Thanks. Dun, dun, dun. Where is it? All right, can people see my screen? Yes, no. Okay, so, all right. So that was uh, some theory about, you know, what we're doing. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, arbitrary choices in here. We realize, yes, they are not like objectively the only way to do things. Um, you know the the data loader. Just a word about the data loader. So this is obviously not the only way. What you how you would you know set up data to predict like the next word from uh, any given uh, context. So then if you look at the example over here, like this is all on the uh, this is on the right of as well, right? But if you wait, so wait, do you still see my slides? Oh uh, no, I think you stopped sharing. Oh, okay, sorry. I think I switched. Okay. Now I think it's good, right? Okay. So if you look at the the figure that we have attached on the on the write up and in here, so this is an example of a batch size being two and C clan being three, right? So um, the thing is for the article input, right? I eat a banana and an apple. So the first sample that you can see, you know, uh, from I eat a, you predict eat a banana. So the correct way to, to understand this is that each token in the in the brown box, which is the input, corresponds to a token in the green box, which is the next token for that particular. So from I, you would predict eat, right? And from eat, you would predict a. And by from eat, I really mean from all the tokens up to eat, right? So from I eat, you would predict a. Uh, and from I eat a, uh, you would predict banana. So that's how the training data is set up. So then this is uh, basically uh, one of the batch. And then for, uh, in, in the sample two, all right, you see banana and N and N and apple. So from banana, you would predict and. And from banana and you would predict n, and from banana and n you would predict apple. Okay, so um, if if you look at this, this is how this is really how the at least the uh, the homework starter code is set up. But then okay, so you might say, hey, we never predict from eat a banana, and we never start with that context and predict the word and, right? That is not. That that's not your model doesn't receive that, and that is at least in in this iteration of the homework that is intended this way. So this is just a particular, you know, choice that uh, that we have made. So this is by no means like I said, as I was trying to say, this is not the objective. If you think that there are there are better ways, uh, we encourage you to experiment with different settings. Um, so you don't have to do everything that we say here. Um, just so you know. But then if you do everything we say, is is definitely going to work. Right, that we can guarantee. 
Okay, so that was some theory about you know how the data is set up, what we're trying to do. Um, so let's look at some specific code. Specifically, these code are adapted from the starter notebook. So um, if you have looked over even the starter notebook, you should be a little bit familiar with the code that we're going to show you. So okay, the, the, these three, these four methods are really the um, the, the methods we're going to be talking about. So um, okay. So forward, um, you might be wondering, you know, what do I do in the in the forward method? Because um, you know, sometimes, like in, in the past homeworks, if you have if you write a forward method, that's usually you know um, you you predict something from the from the input, whatever it is, right? So in the forward method here, you would just predict the next token um, based on a series of tokens that you take in. So um you know obviously you take in x which is like the context so then in the context of the data loader we just showed you from that the x would be you know the tokens i eat and then you would want to output a probability distribution that places an emphasis on the word uh right so you take in x and then you would possibly take in some hidden states for the lstm cells that you're going to be dealing with but if there is no hidden states that can also do you just initialize them uh in however way you want right so the x that you take in are in the shape batch size comma time steps right so batch size means how many sentences are there so in the example here there are two right there are two sentences or like not even two sentences but two sequences so the batch size here is two and the time step that we're referring to so like the second dimension of the shape of x the time step is just a sequence length so like how many tokens are there in each entry in the batch so this this is the shape of the input that you, uh, your forward method is going to be taken in and then um so okay so before i talk about the rest of this um your your model is very simply is uh, conceptually is set up like this okay so you take in some tokens, and then progressively talked about how you cannot just use one hot vector to to treat those tokens so of course you have some sort of an embedding layer to map those tokens to an embedding space um so once you have the tokens in the embedding space then you have a bunch of lstm cells in which you know you update the hidden still uh, the hidden state of those lstm cells um and then you generate you keep generating new hidden states so that uh you can actually make some predictions so, like that's the actual language modeling part right so after the lstm cells uh output a hidden state then you use some sort of you know it's almost like an embedding layer but reversed so that you can map whatever the embedding is to back to the token space right so this this is the three components of the homework for part one it's very simple right the embedding the lstm cells and then the output embedding or like the token probabilities what we call here yes token probabilities all right so the embedding layer is for mapping from uh tokens into your hidden uh your your you know own space and then the lstm cells they operate on your own hidden space and then the last layer the token probabilities they map your uh tokens uh, your hidden space back to the token space all right i hope i have made that clear that's like the the three components of your model that we're going to be referring to um are there any questions to the uh, the three components that I talked about. Did I make that point clearly? You know, uh, your model should only have three things. So if there's if there's question, um, interrupt me or uh, send a message in Zoom chat. Uh, they're both fine. Okay. So back to the code, right? So you take in input in this shape, and then you feed that into the embedding layer, right? We talked about how you have to, like, if, if you want to use tokens at all, you would map them into the, the hidden state space. And then this is how you do it. So um, the, way, the reason why we initialize a list for token probabilities is because we want to collect the uh, hidden states for each time step. Okay, so for okay, so this is going to get a little. If you have three tokens in each sequence, then you're also going to be predicting three tokens, right? You're not just predicting the last time step, you're, you're actually going to be predicting for all of those three tokens. So if you look at the data loader, you know, if your input sequence is I eat a, you're not just going to predict banana, you're going to predict eat a banana, right? 
because from I you predict E, from E to predict L, from L you predict banana. So then if your input sequence has three words, then your output sequence also has three words. And the output sequence is what you think is going to follow from each of your input sequence words at each time step. And you might be thinking, hey, that's cheating because if I see I eat a, uh, then I know that after I is definitely going to be eat, right? But then your model doesn't even know that if you don't set up something fancy. So um, you can just use your model hidden states to, to output like a prediction that's not necessarily going to be the same as what's actually the next token in your input. Okay, so... Um, so that's why we have a list, and then you can see in the end we return the token probabilities list that corresponds to what your model thinks the next token is going to be for each time step. Okay, so for each time step, we get the embedding up to the current step, and what we mean is um, we get the embedding of the words that we're going to be predicting off from uh, at the current time step. So back to the the data loader. So we have three time steps here, right? I have we have three tokens in the sequence, which means we have three time steps. And so for I, we select no context, right? Or we, we only select the context I. That's the only context we have. If we're on the second time step, we select context equal to the first two words. If we're on the third time step, we select context that's equal to the first three words, right? Because you know, if we have a, we, we predict things from I eat a. That's all we do. So in each time step, we get the embedding of all the tokens up to the current time step. So depending on how 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 deep you are into the sequence, you select you know more and more tokens as your context, right? That's your hidden state. And then we feed the embedding through all of these LSTM cells that we have set up um, in the model in it. And then we retrieve the final hidden state output, right? That's pretty straightforward. You just feed the, the input, the embedding, um, and then the hidden state into the LSTM cell, and then you get a new hidden state. And then you just get that and feed it into the other LSTM cells. And eventually, after you're finished with the last LSTM cell, you have the uh, final hidden state. And then you take that final hidden state and feed it into your token probabilities uh, to map it back to the token probability distribution space, right? So then because, as I said, your LSTMs only operate on the uh, hidden state space, and then you want it to be mapped to the token space so you can actually interpret it as a token, right? Because otherwise there's no way to interpret like your hidden state as a token. You, only, you can only do that after mapping. So these are the three things basically you do for each time step. You select appropriate context, you feed them through all your LSTM cells, and then you map it to a token probability distribution, right? And then at each time step, you map the result for that time step uh, to this list, and then in the end, you just return that list, right? Are there any questions about the forward method? Okay. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, as I said, if you have any questions, feel free to just uh, do whatever you want to, to get our attention. Okay. So in here, in the especially in the um, in the short notebook, we have a function set up that's called RNN step. So what that means is um, since we have a lot of you know LSTM cells, um, we we just set up this function so that you can conveniently loop through all your LSTM cells at once. But then you know you can do it outside of this function, it doesn't matter. Um, so Okay, so if you look at the uh, the start of the book, we have made clear that we recommend you to use torch.nn.lstm cell instead of using torch.nn.lstm. And the reason is that for homework for part two, um, your implementation for part one can be adapted to make your time at part two easier. And how you accomplish that is by changing your, uh, your, your code from part one, but then that can only be done by using LSTM cell, you, if you use LSTM, that might work for this homework, but it won't for it won't work for you in P two, and then that's going to cost you a lot of time uh, and stress. So, so yeah, that's our recommendation. And if you look at the documentation for torch.nn.lstm cell, then you'll notice that at each time step, it takes in two things. The first thing is your input, which is going to be your hidden state. 
And the next thing is a tuple. The tuple consists of two things. The first thing is the hidden state of this cell itself. And the next thing is the cell state, what's called a cell state of the cell itself as well. So, um, so think about it like this, all right? For each cell, you're gonna tell it, hey, your hidden state is this and your cell state in this. Now, please process this input for me and get me the output. And then when it outputs, it also outputs its current cell state and its current hidden state, as well as its actual output. All right. So I actually personally find this, you know, this, this torch.nn.lsm cell a little bit confusing because, you know, why can't it just manage its hidden state on its own? Why can't it just do, you know, you feed it something, it gets something out, and then that's simple as that, right? That's what you think an LCM would do. But then it actually also gives you the hidden state back and the cell state back. So then each of the times when you want to feed something to the cell, you need also to feed those things in. So you need like you need a mechanism to map each cell to its most updated cell state and hidden state. And that's the only way you can feed things into the cell because otherwise it's going to ask you for it. It's going to ask you, hey, what is my hidden state and cell state? And it's, I don't know. So it can't process for you. Okay. So um, for the purpose of passing your input vector through each of the LSTM cells one by one, you need more than just a loop like this, right? So you need what's called a hidden states list uh, this list over here. And then this list is going to keep track of all the latest, the most updated hidden state for each cell. So then when you go to that cell, you can fetch the correct hidden state and then feed it to the cell with your input. So then when it gives you the output and it's updated hidden state, you take the output and you store the updated hidden state to your hidden states list. So then you can all, you can still invoke it next time. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, all right, so this is what you do in the RNN step function, all right? You have your embedding, um, you feed it through all your LSTM cells, but then you have to think about how you're going to manage those hidden states and cell states. And then in the end, you return these two things. Okay, so what we also have been uh, talking about is the uh, predict function. So uh you have to complete the function predict which is to predict the next token um these are all very uh straightforward you can read through them on yourself it takes in an input uh, a batch of sequences and then it's going to output your model's guess to what the next token might be so then the the thing to take uh, to pay attention to is that the uh the prediction function it actually outputs a probability distribution right it actually doesn't, the way we intend for it to be, it doesn't output a uh, just a single token. So it, the output is the probability score for every token there is in your vocabulary space. And the reason is that that's the only way we can calculate loss. Because otherwise, if you just take the max, the arg max out of each of your uh, vocabulary, there's no way for us to, to, to like grade the uh, the quality of your model because we have to calculate, you know, cross entropy loss based on uh, probability scores for, for each token, right? So this is like, just keep in mind, this is not for you to return just a single token, but you should return the probability distribution of what you think the next token is going to be. Okay. So this is prediction function. And then we have the uh, generation function. So the thing about these things is as long as you understand the forward function, then all that is going to be easy, right? But if you don't understand forward, they're going to have a hard time. So please uh, make sure you, you understand the forward function and what it's supposed to do, especially the RNS steps, because that's like the, the centerpiece of what you're going to be doing. All right, back to generation. So the goal with generation is you have an incomplete a sequence or you have like some sort of a sequence and then you want to predict the next token and then you want to predict the next and next token so then um in the end you should be able to complete the token up to you know let's say 10 or a fixed number of additional tokens that's how you complete an incomplete sequence so um since your model is capable of predicting the next token given the past few tokens then your model is obviously capable of completing the sequence or provide uh you know conducting the operation we just talked about uh just a second ago 
So um, each token is drawn from the, uh, the distribution that your model uh, generates, right? So as we said, like the maximum likelihood estimation, the, the any token, like the first token is generated based on the only thing preceding it, which is SOS. And the second token is generated on everything before it, which means T1, the first token, and then an SOS, right? So for TN, you generate it based on all the past tokens um, that it's before it. And um, so how do you take in the past tokens and then give you an output? You do it like you do it with the forward function, right? That should be very straightforward because the forward function we just illustrated, it's how you would take a bunch of sequences. You select the appropriate context at any time step, and then you feed in that context through a bunch of LSTM cells, and then it gives you the output. And then you, uh, you convert that output to a probability distribution, right? That's how you code up. That's how you implement this process we're talking about here, which is predicting every token based on its past, right? That forward function is the workflow for this, right? Um, this should be very clear to people. Um, if not, just try to understand it. So like this, uh, this screenshot from the write-up, like uh, the, the, uh, the idea that every token's probability is related to everything that comes before it, this is the theory um, of our four function. Our four function is the implementation of this theory. Okay. So to implement the generation function, um, okay, so this is just a slide about, uh, you know, the, the a description of what the model does you can read on it uh, on it on your own uh, but then the idea is that we're going to be judging uh, or grading how well your model generates uh, additional tokens for a sequence um, and if your lm if your language model is well trained or trained on good data or trained uh, you know using using appropriate schemes then the extensions that it finds that it generates from uh, existing sequences should be uh, closer to the distribution of you know English data in general uh, and should be verified with another LM when when we apply another LM to just calculate the, the distribution or calculate the probability of the sequence that your LM generates then that should be a good score so that's how we're going to be grading it okay so this is the code for the generation function um, you are first going to pass your input through the forward function to get the token probability distribution and the hidden states list. Okay, so the token probability distribution, what is this? Do people know? Like, uh, is, is someone willing to take a guess? How do we interpret the, the token probability distribution output from the forward of X? People have any idea about what four does? Basically, this is this is like what four does. All right. So, um, wait, Tian C. Okay. So, Yutian um, Thomason says, is the probability distribution over the uh, vocab for each time step output by the model, which is correct. Thank you. It's correct. So. Um, you select from that the next token, all right? Because we talked about in the predict function, we're not interested in getting just a token, but then we're interested in getting a probability distribution. But then in the generation function, we're actually interested in getting just like just a, a, an actual token, right? So if you have, um, as our friend Thomas has said, if you have the probability distribution over the vocab for each time step, you certainly can select the next token from the last time step, right? So you select that and you append it to our result or the buildup array to be returned. Uh, we call it generated sequence. Um, and then for each of the time steps that you want to complete the sequence with, um, you do that again. So you process the next token and hidden states list through the model, which means that you select appropriate uh, context for your for your next token. So the next token would basically depend on 
all the tokens before it, right? So you select the tokens before it, and then you select the hidden states list that you've been keeping track of. In, uh, remember how I talked about, you need to keep track of all the, hit, the LSTM cell states, right? You select that and you select the context and you pass through forward and you get the, mo uh, you, you get the most probable token for the next time set because the forward uh, gives you the, uh, the distribution for all time steps. Okay, so this actually is going to be straightforward. Um, you just append the uh, uh, the generated sequence, and then you know you stack them just to keep the last time step generated works, and then you return the completed sequence. So this this code is also in the starter code, um, which you can take a look. Okay. So those were the functions that you are supposed to implement. Um, if there are any questions, always uh, make a post on Piazza or actually make a follow-up post on the homework for P1 post already existing on Piazza. Um, and as the write-up has discussed, these are some you know, training and regularization techniques that you can try. Um, I see people have already gotten started with it. Uh, the locked dropout is just a fancy variation of dropout that uh, applies the same mask uh, across all the time steps. So then it's somehow supposed to give you better results according to papers. Um, and the embedding dropout is how you would like, uh, if you think about dropout as, okay, so right now I'm going to give you like a quick run through of like, a simple description of what these are and then these if you're interested you can you can try them out you can look them up on your own because these are really you know advanced techniques that if you're interested you should you should like find your resources to try them out or you can try whatever thing you find but then these are are interesting things that we can uh, recommend so the embedding dropout is if you think about dropout as randomly dropping on neurons in a network right so the embedding dropout is you drop out words in the input token space, okay? So how you do that is you would convert the input into an actual one hot vector, and then you would apply some dropout on it too, so that some words will totally disappear. Okay, I know this is a strange concept, but then it seems to have done well. So then, you know, the on the run that you apply dropout on embedding dropout, some of some of the words in your input vocab space will just disappear. Okay, so um, weight tying is a technique that uh, allows you to basically make the weight matrix from you know uh, from two to, uh, layers the same object the same matrix. So then it reduces the complexity of your model to avoid overfitting. Um, activation regularization and temporal activation regularization. So these are the idea that you would regularize the uh, value upon activations in your network. And how you would do that is, I've tried that once, it's actually pretty interesting. So remember, you, you know, in your typical training loop, you would say, you know, uh, loss equals to criterion of uh, whatever your output is and the ground truth, right? So like that's a standard line when, when you're writing the, um, the training loop. So with these items, if you're, if you're implementing activation regularization uh, with the real temporal, if you're implementing this, you're going to be collecting additional loss from specific layers in your network. And you're basically going to say, okay, loss equals to criterion of your prediction and ground truth, right? And after that, you're going to say, okay, loss plus equals. So you're going to add something to loss. What you're going to add, you're going to add an L1 loss or an L2 loss of some layers in your network. So, you know, say you have a, you have a layer, that's say it's a linear layer or it's like whatever layer, um, and you want to apply activation regularization on it. So you would basically from torch or something import L1 or L2 loss, and then you're going to say, okay, L1 loss of that layer um, and you're going to add that to the loss that you're going to be back propagating. So this basically, uh, what this basically does it is it penalizes values specifically at certain layers. So then if you think that those layers are overfitting, you can combat that. 
Um, but then there are like, this is just a very coarse overview of what it seems to be. Um, you should always feel free to look up resources and, uh, and go through the write-up, which uh, contains more information. All right, so these are the five advanced techniques that we think is worth looking into. All right. So um, general tips can start early. Um, the, uh, the, I think the early deadline to hand this in, it's, it's not mandatory at all, is optional, but then it's a bonus. The early hand in is next Saturday at midnight. Okay, so you have, uh, what, six days or six and a half days, almost a week from now on. And since you're in the boot camp, I know you're all in very good shape to get this done in the, by the early deadline. Um, so read the write up carefully, attend the boot camp. If you have any questions, ask us. All right, Prakriti and I are in charge of homework for part one, and we are committed to uh, make it a successful experience for you. So, um, oh, I see there's a question in the chat. Um, betting dropout, how do we use this? Um, okay, so do people, uh, I, I see the chat question and uh, can you actually take a look because I want to gather, um, are there any other questions that we can pull? Uh, yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you? Yep. Uh, can uh, could you please go to the slide about the forward function? Sure. Yes. Um. Here you said that when we uh when we are calculating uh token underlying embedding underlying T, you said we have to get the embedding up to the current time step, right? Yes, I think um, it's a little bit confusing to me because if we keep calculating uh, the token underlying um, uh, embedding underlying T uh, to to the up to the current time step, that means the size, the the dimension of this variable is keep changing. It's keeping changing. Yes. but we have yes. to feed this variable to uh, R N step in the next right. line, right? So that right. But basically, the embed if the size of the embedding variable is uh, is changing, how do we do that? And okay. if I un so, understand correctly, I think that the token underlying on un underlying embedding underlying t should be um, the embedding of the current time step t, because all the previous information should be fed into our uh, LSTM cell using the hidden step hidden hidden states, but not the embedding itself. Right. So, um, all right. I should make sure before I, um, we, if we take a look at the figure in the write up, right. Mm -hmm. Actually for each time step, only one word, one token is fed into the LSTM cell. Right. But not, not all the words, all, but not all previous tokens. So the the input to the uh, RNN step is actually you select the embedding. So okay, so the embeddings that's up to the uh, the embeddings that you map your input to, right? That basically maps your entire input, like all the batches and all the time steps to the embedding space, right? Yeah, that's not the problem. Uh, right. What I want so, to focus is in the for loop, in the for right. loop of, of time steps. Okay, so I think the correct, correct way to implement it is actually select the, um, the embeddings up to the, the current time step in all the batches. Um, and you're asking, okay, how does but the dimension LSTM is, keep, is keeping changing, right? variable size, right? So the dimension will change. And how then, do we, uh, so how do we feed this 
token underlying embedding underlying t into the rn step function in the next line okay so um the lstm cell you just have to special um, specify an input size and hidden size which is the output size right so as long as your input size is the embedding size you can actually take in arbitrary embeddings so the sequence length of of the embedding doesn't matter yes okay Okay. All right. Um, okay, let me look at the chat question. Um, how do we use embedding dropout with activation regularization? Is embedding dropout? This mask seems to be of shape, batch size, hidden size, given that it's over a specific slice of HT. But for embedding dropout, our mask is done on the word level of broadcasted uh, the output from the embedding layer. Um, do we use embedding dropout so you um not sure if i understand your question completely so i think the short answer is you don't have to use embedding dropout with activation regularization although i'm not totally sure what the conflict that you see is um so maybe can you clarify like why do you think you cannot yeah i can those? clarify yeah so i was trying to implement this and based on the write-up so for um let me see uh 4.4.4 activation regularization i think the definition of ar requires that uh we need to perform a dot product from mask uh on top of the slice of a hidden state which is a sub h sub t and the mask if we use embedding dropout like the mask shape as i described the second dimension is embedding size but then h sub t the second dimension will be the hidden state size which we uh, input when we specify the um lstm cell so, okay, so it's gonna we be can't per, yeah which section in the write-up are you talking about, um are looking at is it I'm looking 4. at 4.4.4. Yeah. Okay. So different from military position. Okay. And uh, where's the chat? Um yeah, because I think it works fine if we just do a normal dropout on top of the hidden state. But if we want to do uh, embedding dropouts, the mask mm -hmm. won't be of the same shape as the hidden state. So we need to find a way to match that. Yeah. Okay. So the mask doesn't have to be in the size of hidden state, right? Because, okay, so locked dropout means it's just like dropout. You can apply dropout to different layers and that will have a different shape, right? But that doesn't matter. So if you apply dropout to a specific layer or like place it after a specific layer that means you're dropping out neurons from bef right before your dropout right that's what mm -hmm. dropout does and that's what lock dropout does so uh lock dropout doesn't have to be in the shape of hidden state like if you apply it to your token space it's the shape of token space right so yeah Maybe you're thinking that you, you can only have one of those in your entire network. No, you can have those anywhere you want. And anywhere you put it, you can have it to the shape you want there only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, I guess I was trying to figure out if we can apply um, it on the embedding dropout, but perhaps since we didn't actually use the activation on the embedding layer, maybe we shouldn't do the activation regularization on embedding dropout. Yeah, that's what I would recommend because those are two different things, right? So the activation dropout is recommended because you want to penalize 
function activations that are very large or are very small. And the reason for that is because you're either going to overshoot or you're going to have very poor backpropagation uh, efficacy. Mm -hmm. So, but embedding is not part of those, right? Embedding, you don't apply activations. You, it's actually just a linear map from your token to the hidden state. So then I don't think you should actually be applying it to, onto the embedding layer per se. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, if there are no more questions, um, we can actually dismiss. And then if you have any questions, post on Piazza. All right. Do people have last minute things to say? Oh, uh, just a quick third. question. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Oh. Uh, who go first? We should go first. Um, wait, I think you're the only one, right? Uh -oh. Am I the only one? Am I the only one oh. having the question so far? Oh, I have another uh, question, but you can go first. Go ahead first. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, just yeah, a quick question sure. about uh, do we have any suggestion for uh, embedding dimension and the hidden hidden size? Um, so. I mean, it's it's what you would find out in ablations. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so the embedding dimension and the hidden size. Um, in our ablations, we actually take like reasonable numbers, like uh, you know, around two three hundred, and then but so theoretically, a higher dimension or a higher dimensionality is always good but that also limited to the, the amount of data that you have, right? Because if you have very high dimensional representation, but then you only have this much data to train it with, then that's actually not gonna be good. Um, it's just gonna be stuck in a poor minimum, local minimum. So just do experiments, but then I would say not have it smaller than a hundred because obviously, you know, if you only have, if you have, tens of thousands of vocabulary and you only store them in a hundred dimension test not gonna be good. Okay, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So my question is kind of slightly similar as well. What I was wondering since sequence lanes can be very, very different because I think some of the sequences are like a couple in the thousands in terms of the number of tokens contained in the article. So I was wondering if you have any recommendation of a given range that we should maybe search on, or maybe if you recommend us searching on the log space. Um, yeah. So I think your idea of searching on the log space is already a good idea. So um, the toy example we gave sequence length of three is definitely not going to be enough, right? So if, I were to design the whole experiment, I would say a sequence length of higher is nearly always better, at least um, instinctively, because, um, you know, if I select a, a sequence of, you know, let's say a hundred words, then I'm still going to be predicting words based on, you know, based on the first few words, and I'm going to predict the next word, right? I'm not cutting off any information by selecting a longer uh, sequence. And so, on the first side, that seems like it's almost always going to be good. But then you're also going to be predicting unrelated sentences from each other, right? So like if this first sentence is not related to the second sentence at all, then if you select both of them in the same sequence, you're going to be predicting the first word of the second sentence based on the first sentence. And that's not always going to work out, right? So on this account, it will looks better that you would select a sequence length that's um that most you know coherent related sentences um are in the length of right so um so i think you should start with that thought and try to do some experiments on you know maybe a few words and then the length of, uh, of a sentence a few sentences a paragraph etc um i hope that is some useful food to, for thought that you can use Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question to follow up on that. So basically, uh, check what is the 
smallest sequence length to decide what sequence sequence length would work in this case. Okay. Let's check the smallest sequence length. Yeah. Uh, I might be not getting it right here, but you said if you select like a se sequence length, the higher the better, right? But then uh, it depends on how, what is the smallest sequence length uh, of the entire data set, right? Mm -hmm. So if I select a sequence length that is larger than what uh, the smallest one that would be in the data set, then it might not work as well. I'm not sure if I'm uh, uh, understanding this right. Um, yeah, if, if I get your question correctly, then yeah, if, if your sequence length is too small, it's not going to work well. Okay. Okay. I, I would have to um, uh, read the write up myself to understand better. Sorry. That's okay. Any questions? Just, just, uh, so just maybe questions. maybe we can take a look at the statistics of the of the training data set about the, the sequence length of each article, like like the mean of uh, the sequence length or the 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 mode. To okay, get so a, the to get an idea. something you define the sequence. No, I, I mean the the uh, the article length. Yeah, like sentence article. Sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a good way to start. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One last question, if nobody has. Yeah, sure. Uh, so for the activation regularization, wait time, and the two dropouts, and uh, the TAR, are we supposed to implement all of them? Or uh, it's still... No, there's a suggestion for you to try out. Okay, I think yeah. you will have success even without them, but then if you're having trouble, just try out some of these. Okay, got it. Okay, just wondering how long would each training epoch take on average? For me on Colab, it took me, I think definitely less than a minute because we have a small data set and the relatively simple model. All right. All right, we, I think we need to head off, um, but then you're always welcome to ask additional questions on Piazza. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm.